The Lord be with you. A reading from the Holy Gospel according to Matthew. Jesus said to his disciples, Do not think that I have come to abolish the law or the prophets. I have not come to abolish, but to fulfill. Amen, I say to you, until heaven and earth pass away, not the smallest letter or the smallest part of a letter will pass from the law until all things have taken place. Therefore, whoever breaks one of the least of these commandments and teaches other to do so will be called least in the kingdom of heaven. But whoever obeys and teaches these commandments will be called greatest in the kingdom of heaven. I tell you, unless your righteousness surpasses that of the scribes and the Pharisees, you will not enter the kingdom of heaven. You have heard that it was said to your ancestors, you shall not kill, and whoever kills will be liable to judgment. But I say to you, Whoever is angry with brother will be liable to judgment. And whoever says to brother, Raka, will be answerable to the Sanhedrin. And whoever says, you fool, will be liable to fiery Gehenna. Therefore, if you bring your gift to the altar, and there recall that your brother has anything against you, leave your gift there at the altar. Go first and be reconciled with your brother. Then come and offer your gift. Settle with your opponent quickly while on the way to court. Otherwise, your opponent will, be handed, will hand you over to the judge, and the judge will hand you over to the guard, and you will be thrown into prison. Amen, I say to you. You will not be released until you have paid the last penny. You have heard that it was said, you shall not commit adultery. But I say to you, everyone who looks at a woman with lust has already committed adultery with her in his heart. If your right eye causes you to sin, tear it out and throw it away. It is better for you to lose one of your members than to have your whole body thrown into Gehenna. If your right hand causes you to sin, cut it off and throw it away. It is better for you to lose one of your members than have your whole body go into Gehenna. It was also said, Whoever divorces his wife must give her a bill of divorce. But I say to you, whoever divorces his wife, unless the marriage is lawful, causes her to commit adultery. And whoever marries a divorced woman commits adultery. Again, you have heard that it was said to your ancestors, Do not take a false oath, but make good to the Lord all that you vow. But I say to you, do not swear at all, not by heaven, for it is... God's throne, nor by the earth, for it is his footstool, nor by Jerusalem, for it is the city of the great king. Do not swear by your head, for you cannot make a single hair white or black. Let your yes mean yes, and your no mean no. Anything more is from the evil one. The Gospel of the Lord. As we continue to walk through, to hear the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus is drawing for us the picture of what a transformed human person looks like. Someone transformed by the life of grace. That he's presenting a kind of slideshow of what sanctity really is, of what holiness is. The moral Christian vision is that it is received and not achieved. That holiness is a work of God. The human being acting out of the power of his flesh alone cannot keep and surely cannot fulfill the law of God. The law given to Moses. The experience of God's people in the Old Testament bears this out. They were not able to do it themselves. To keep it perfectly themselves would fall into sin. That true holiness, not merely ethical rule-keeping, is possibly, possible only by and through God's grace. 
We must understand that the moral vision given by Jesus as a description, rather than just a mere prescription, then notice what the gospel says, what Jesus says, that I have come not to abolish, but to fulfill the law. It is Jesus who fulfills the law, that we who are more and more in him, and he in us, do what he does. It is his work. And Jesus describes these signs that, to show how we are transformed human beings. That the power of his cross goes to work in us, puts sin to death, that our old self is crucified with him, so that sin will no longer be master over us, that we will be freed from sin and death. This is a work of God. This is the power in the blood of him, in his cross. That that power comes to us by grace and is all a work of God. Hence, in today's gospel, Jesus is not merely simply giving us a rigorous set of rules, even though, yes, they are rigorous. But he's describing what that transformed human person is like. That his description is not this impossible ideal, but is set forth as the normal Christian life. The normal Christian is that transformed human person. By his grace. The normal Christian man has authority over his anger, over his sexuality, loves his wife and family, is a man of his word. And all of this comes to him as the fruit of God's grace. That Jesus' moral vision is that by his grace, we do not merely keep the law, but fulfill it. That the key word is fulfill, meaning to fill something up until it is full to exceed the minimum requirements, to go for the maximum. That when we fulfill the law, we enter into that full vision, into that full meaning of the law, living out that life of grace, having that love of God in our lives. And so our Lord gives us different descriptions of a transformed person today. And these pictures, these descriptions are often called antitheses. Because they're all formulated in this way. That you have heard that it was said, but I say to you. The key point is to see them as pictures of what happens to a person whom Jesus is really living in. That he goes and starts out, you have heard that it was said to your ancestors, you shall not kill. But I say to you, whoever is angry with brother is liable to judgment. Whoever says to brother Raka will be answerable to the Sanhedrin. And whoever says, you fool, will be liable to fiery Gehenna. The Lord teaches us that the commandment not to kill has a deeper meaning. What leads to murder? Is it not the furnace of anger and retribution, of hatred within us? That we may all experience that flash of anger and it passes by. Further, there is such a thing as righteous anger, which is caused by a perception of injustice and sin. Our Lord himself exhibited this sort of anger, like when he cleansed the temple of the money changers. Or we can have that kind of righteous anger by protesting at the March for Life, protesting the injustice of abortion. Or we can think of those who marched during the civil rights protesting that injustice that existed in that time. That this type of anger is not condemned. That rather the anger that is condemned is that which is born of hate and vengeance. The anger that goes so far as to wish harm to another. To deny that other their human dignity. This is what leads to murder. That the Lord has this sort of anger in mind is revealed in the examples he cites, which use the words raka and fool. That these words express contempt and hatred. And raka, while it doesn't really have a clear translation for us, seems to have about the same impact as like a four-letter word does in our world. That this is very hurtful words, expressing deep contempt. That such utterances cannot come from a person who the Lord is authentically living in. And to the degree that we allow Christ to live in us, they will not. That increasingly we cannot hate others, for the Lord is in us. And he died for all of us out of love. 
How can we hate someone he loves? The Lord makes it clear that if we don't rid ourselves of this anger, we're going to jail. And he said, settle with your opponent quickly on the way to court. Otherwise, you're going to be handed over to the judge. The judge is going to hand you over to the guard, and you're going to be thrown in jail. And that you're going to be in jail until you've paid the last penny. And either the, we allow the Lord to effect this reconciliation for us, or we're off to jail. That we had to spend that time in probably, I would guess, purgatory, since it says you won't be released until the last penny has been paid. That it would seem that that's the release he's talking about. But it's still jail. It's not heaven. We're not going to heaven unless and until this matter has been resolved. Why delay the issue? That we need to let the word, Lord, work it now. And don't go to jail because of our grudges, because of our stubborn refusal to admit our own offenses. That we need to ask for that mercy instead. That you have heard it said, you shall not commit adultery. But I say to you, everyone who looks at a woman with lust has already committed adultery with her in his heart. The Lord teaches us that the commandment against adultery has a deeper meaning. That it's not merely about transgression, marital boundaries. That to fulfill this law full means to be chaste in all matters, in mind and in heart. That it's certainly wrong to engage in any illicit unions. That if someone's looking at impure images, thinking, fantasizing about others in a wrong way. One is already in adultery. That what the Lord is offering us here is a clean mind and a pure heart that he spoke about in the Beatitudes. That he's offering us authority over our sexuality, over our thoughts. And for those who are in Christ, self-mastery increases. The purity of mind and heart become a greater reality. That our flesh alone cannot do this. But thanks to God who gives us victory in Christ, it can be done. That it's his work in us to give us these gifts, to make it so for us. And he goes on, if your right eye causes you to sin, tear it out, throw it away. Or your right hand that causes you to sin, cut it off, throw it away. That it's better for us to lose one of our members than to have our whole body go to Gehenna. That we must be serious about these matters. That the Lord is using hyperbole here to make a point. That it's more serious to sin than to lose your eyesight or one of your limbs. But most people don't think this way. They make light of sin. Especially sexual sin. That God does not make light of sin though. Jesus teaches here that it's worse to lose our soul than to lose part of our body. If we were to lose our eyesight or a limb to cancer, we would probably beg God to deliver us from that. We do beg God to deliver us from that. Why do we not think of sin in the same way? Why are we not horrified to the same degree about the sins in our life? That we're clearly skewed in our thinking. That Jesus is clear that these sort of sins can land us in hell, which he is called here as Gehenna. That that impure thinking, that impure images, the impure actions are not part of the life in Christ who wants to give us freedom and authority over our passions, over the pleasures of our flesh. That many people today are in some pretty serious chains when it comes to the flesh. That Jesus stands before us all and says, Come, let me live in you to give you the gift of purity. That it will be my gift to you. It will be my work in you to set you free from disordered passions. To give you that clean mind, that pure heart. That it was also said, Whoever divorces his wife must give her a bill of divorce. But I say to you, whoever divorces his wife, unless the marriage is unlawful, causes her to commit adultery. Whoever marries a divorced woman commits adultery. At the time of Jesus, divorce was permitted in Israel. 
that a man had to follow certain rules. And those rules depended upon which rabbi you went to, how he interpreted the rules. And so you could get that bill of divorce because something had been transgressed in a very serious way. But you could also get a divorce if, say, your wife just cooked a bad meal and you didn't like how it tasted. You could go off to the right rabbi and get a divorce for that just because you don't like her cooking. Wives, keep that in mind. You better cook nice things for your husbands. Okay? But the Lord says... That to fulfill marriage is to love your spouse. They teach us that when he begins to live his life in us, love for our spouse will grow. Love for our children will deepen. That divorce won't even occur to us. That who wants to divorce? Someone they love. That if the Lord can help us to love our enemy, surely he can cause us to love our family members, to love our spouse better. That some of the deepest hurts can occur in marriage. But the Lord can heal all wounds. Help us to forget the painful things in our past. The Lord is very blunt here. He simply refuses to recognize a piece of paper from a human judge approving a divorce. That God is not impressed by a legal document. And he may well consider that couple married despite of that legal document. The Lord says, come to me. Bring me your broken marriage. Bring me your broken heart. Let me bring healing. That sometimes one of the spouses simply refuses to be there, leaves, refuses to live in peace. Then in such a case, our Lord can heal by removing the loneliness, by removing the hurt. That might drive one to do something more foolish, into more trouble. That we need to let our Lord bring strength, bring healing, bring a restoration of unity. That he still works miracles, and sometimes that's what it takes, asking him for that miracle. And so then, here are pictures of what these transformed human beings look like, of what we look like. Then remember, the Sermon on the Mount is filled with more than promises, than with descriptions. With descriptions more than prescriptions. The Lord is telling us what he can and will do for us. That in all these ways, our Lord is not merely keeping the law, but fulfilling it. That the law is not merely kept, but fulfilled. That it is filled full in that all these implications are abundantly and joyfully lived out as Jesus Christ transforms each of us. For what Christ does, we do. That we are in him and he in his us. That he is that vine. We are the branches. And as long as we remain in him, we and he in us, we will bear much fruit. That apart from him, we can do nothing. That we need to be those witnesses of this transformative power of God's grace, of Jesus' grace and love for us. Witnesses to the cross, bearing it well. That way, at the end of our lives, our Lord can turn to us to say the Beatitudes when he sees us as a recognition of the transformed person that we are. To see in us those descriptions of the Beatitudes. That indeed that we are blessed. That we have received that kingdom of God. 